Hello and welcome to another installment of North Carolina Maritime Museum in Beaufort's virtual programming. My name is Benjamin Wonderly and I have prepared a slideshow lecture that I will narrate about the Cape Lookout Lighthouse. What I hope to do is talk a little bit about the history of this lighthouse and some of the events that have occurred in the surrounding area. We hope to have a, another installment of our virtual programming up soon about sea turtles. That presentation will be given by our natural science curator, Keith Rittmaster, and it will not involve any talk about eating the sea turtles. So let's start off by looking at the location of this particular lighthouse. I've put on this map of the eastern seaboard a red star that signifies where Cape Lookout is located along North Carolina's coast. Um, so one interesting thing to point out is that if you uh, were to look at the coastline and you look at the portion of North Carolina, you see that the, North, the Outer Banks uh, off of our coast um, project farther out into the ocean than most of the eastern seaboard. Um, for example, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, New Jersey, and then to the south, South Carolina and Georgia. So any ships that happened to be sailing by our coast had to go around these outer banks. Now, when you zoom in on a satellite image of the North Carolina coast, and here you can see Cape Hatteras uh, to the north and then Cape Lookout to the southwest of there, um, off of each of those points of land, there are some dangerous sandbars and shoals. They're very difficult to sail around because you don't necessarily see them uh, unless there's a lot of wave action on them, but you could run aground, um, especially if you were sailing in uh, poor visibility. Uh, and you would not want something like this to happen. So this was a photograph that was taken along the Outer Banks of North Carolina in around uh, 1899, a shipwreck that was stranded on the beach. So looking at, again at uh, this satellite image of the coast, uh, I've put some uh, towns on there that existed uh, around the late 1700s in North Carolina. In 1789, Congress establishes the U.S. Lighthouse Service in an effort to mark these dangerous locations that ships had to sail by. Um, 1804, funds are appropriated for a lighthouse on or near the pitch of Cape Lookout. So that meant kind of the highest point closest to uh, Cape Lookout point, the highest piece of land. So who was the, the lighthouse establishment? Well, they were going to be responsible for uh, construction and management of these lighthouses along the coast. Um, this little timeline here kind of jumps ahead and, and shows you how that, that agency changed over the years and who eventually ended up being in charge of lighthouses al along our coastline. Um, but we see in 1789, it was the lighthouse establishment and then actually the Revenue Cutter Service, then it became the Lighthouse Board, and then we have some other um, points in here that came along uh, throughout time. Um, so we had other organizations forming that were really all along the same lines of trying to, to prevent shipwrecks or save victims from shipwreck. So the U.S. Life Saving Service is established. Um, the Lighthouse uh, Board becomes the Bureau of Lighthouses in 1910. Uh, 1915, the Life Saving Service and the Revenue Cutter Service merge and they form the Coast Guard. 1939, the Lighthouse Service joins the U.S. Coast Guard. And to note here, uh, Cape Lookout is located within the uh, National Seashore. So in 1966, uh, the land that the Cape Lookout Lighthouse is located on becomes the Cape Lookout National Seashore. In 2003, the lighthouse and the associated buildings are, are actually, it's not 
until then that they're transferred to the National Park Service from the Coast Guard. So they were actually were the ones that still owned the lighthouse and the surrounding buildings. Um, so that transfer happened in 2003, but the Coast Guard still maintained the light in the tower. Now we know what the Cape Lookout Lighthouse looks like today, but there was actually an earlier version of the lighthouse, um, an earlier lighthouse at that location. And it was built in 1812. And this is a drawing that was done um, by the, uh, for the National Park Service. Uh, and it, because there's no images or photographs of that original tower, um, they could only go on descriptions and uh, the orders for the, the construction of, of that um, structure. So you can see it was a octagonal uh, base to it. So it actually had sides on it, had eight sides. Um, it was constructed of wood and it had a shingle, a wood shingle exterior that was red and white horizontal bands. And it was only about 104 feet in height. Its light source uh, came from a series of uh, oil lamps. Uh, they called them argand lamps, and there was 13 of them. And they were situated uh, in a circular fashion, uh, and each one was positioned in front of a parabolic reflector. Um, if you, the drawing on the left is um, what one of these lamps might have looked like. The drawing on the right shows you how the lamp was positioned at the focal point, then the light would bounce off of the reflector and be projected outwards. And then the diagram at the bottom, it was kind of a, my attempt at uh, showing what the uh, setup might have looked like with 13 lamps around a circular uh, design. Uh, now this was system was improved and in 1956 at Cape Lookout Lighthouse a Fresnel lens was installed. This was designed by French engineer Auguste Fresnel and this reduced the number of lamps but it increased the light projection so it didn't need as many of those oil lamps inside. Um, the lens that we uh, see an example of one in this picture here but it increased how far the light could be projected. So it was available in seven orders, and the first order was the largest. Now this is a picture of a fourth order lens, so they decrease in, in size as the numbers go up. Um, and this is on display actually in the Maritime Museum. It was a particular lens that came from a screw pile lighthouse on the Potomac River uh, in uh, Maryland. Um, but a first order lens would have been the same exact design, it just would have been much larger and maybe even stand uh, over five or six feet tall. This improved the visibility up to 19 miles for that early Cape Lookout lighthouse. Now, ongoing complaints from mariners that were passing by Cape Lookout uh, prompted Congress to appropriate money for a new lighthouse in 1857. So the complaints were that you were more likely to run aground looking for the lighthouse than it would be uh, in able to uh, uh, help you in any way. So it was, it was more of a problem than it was uh, in, in any type of navigational aid. Um, so the new style of lighthouse would be the model for others built along the coast. And these drawings show you some of the architectural plan uh, for the Cape Lookout Lighthouse. The drawing on the left shows how there was an outer and an inner wall. Um, this provided uh, strength to the, to the structure because it was going to be very tall. Uh, you can see I have on the right put some of the measurements to the uh, height of the tower. Um, the, the focal point of the light would have been about 150 feet. The roof of the tower, one 61 and uh, the spire on top at 163 and if you count the little um, 
rod at the top of that would have been 169. But you also look at the uh, thickness of that wall. So at the bottom, it's actually an eight foot thick. Um, and you count the inner and outer wall and then it tapers as it goes to the top. So this would be a brick structure. And it was, um, the construction was uh, supervised by Lieutenant William Henry Chase Whiting, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The tower was finished in 1859. Um, and it was just basically a red brick tower. Um, so it looked a lot different than, than we know it today. Uh, in this little uh, timeline here, I just wanted to point out some interesting uh, events that occurred uh, around the time of the Civil War, which um, was shortly after the tower was finished. Uh, in 1861, the Confederate government orders all lenses removed from the coastal lighthouses and navigational beacons. This would make it more difficult for Union uh, forces to uh, sail along the coast um, and be more likely to, to run aground and cause problems for them. But in 1863, Union forces install a, a smaller lens, uh, but at least it was something um, so that they could use it to help navigate around Cape Lookout. In 1864, there was actually an attempt to um, extinguish that, that light uh, again, um, but by this, this method, instead of removing a the lens, they were just going to blow it up and, and damage the whole tower um, so that the Union wouldn't be able to put another lens in, in the lighthouse. It was unsuccessful, but it did damage some of the structure, the, st the stairs on the inside, um, and the mechanism that was used to um, for, for the light itself. So in 1865, those lenses that were originally removed, remember there was a first order Fresnel lens in that tower, was taken out of the 1812 tower and put in the 1859 tower. They were found in Raleigh and they were returned to their rightful lighthouses, but the one that was for Cape Lookout, it needed some repairs. So they actually sent it to France. Um, in 1867, it returns from France by way of New York. Uh, and it was uh, eventually sent back down to the Cape Lookout lighthouse. Um, an interesting note is that in 1873, the Lighthouse Board orders that distinctive day marks are painted on the lighthouses. Um, so prior to uh, 1873, this is maybe what it would have looked like out there uh, on Core Banks, uh, in the grounds of the lighthouse. You had on the left, a basically, basically a brick um, 1859 tower. You had there in the middle, the 1812 structure, probably still standing. Um, eventually it, it was taken down, uh, but it was had the red and white horizontal bands. The original keepers quarters is off to the right there. Um, this was just a kind of a sketch and drawing of and um, Photoshop of, of what uh, the scene might have looked like uh, out there on Cape Lookout uh, for 1873. So the pattern that was assigned for the day mark, this was the day mark was what mariners would see during the day while they were sailing past the lighthouse. You didn't necessarily need to use the light beacon, uh, but the tower and what it looked like could help identify you know, the location and where you were. Um, so was it supposed to be diamonds or diagonal checkers because uh, you, you look at these two designs here and all you have to do is turn one um, a little bit and you get checkers. Uh, so it's, it's a little confusing. Um, and a lot of people actually believe that Cape Lookout Lighthouse got the wrong pattern um, because we know that uh, the diamond shoals that exist off of Cape Hatteras, um, you know, people will always assume that, well, Cape Hatteras was supposed to get diamonds because it marked diamond shoals, but that's not, that's not true. Uh, the U.S. Lighthouse Board issued a notice to mariners 
um, announcing the changes that would make the lighthouses more distinguishable. So you had all these lighthouses and they were red brick, but they needed a day mark pattern. So a distinct pattern was chosen for each lighthouse, Cape Hatteras, Spiral Bands, Cape Lookout, Checkered, and Body Island, Horizontal Bands. So they said checkered, but that uh, that meant black and white checkered, but the, they ended up putting them on a diagonal and maybe it was easier to paint the checkers uh, in that fashion on, on a, a round tower that was tapered. Um, but nonetheless, the, the diamonds, what they ended up looking like, uh, the white ones face east and west and the black ones face north and south. This is an interesting picture that was shared to me by a former colleague of mine, uh, the Cape Lookout Lighthouse. Um, before it, it was getting uh, its um, a, a new, uh, a refurbished um, paint uh, put on the tower, so it had the black and white uh, pattern to it. But in this particular year, in 1996. Um, Someone was contracted to paint the lighthouse just to keep it up and, and make it looking nice. And uh, Mr. Moore actually came by uh, during that time and they had first painted it in all white. I guess it was maybe a primer coat or something before they ended up putting the black um, checkers on there. So I thought that was kind of interesting. It would throw people people off to see something like that. Um, so here is the Cape Hatteras lighthouse. That was completed in 1870 and, and again 1873 it got it, its spiral bands for its mark and then the uh, body island lighthouse completed in 1872 so it was only red brick for about a year before it got its uh, horizontal black and white um, bands um, so these those two body island and cape Hatteras, were actually designed uh, after the cape lookout lighthouse i know they're different sizes but the design idea from the Cape Lookout Lighthouse is what those two were built after, as well as the Curatuck Lighthouse. It was completed in 1875. Now, the other three towers that looked exactly the same, the Lookout, Hatter, and the Body Island, uh, had already been painted and with distinct day marks. So maybe that's why they left the Curatuck Lighthouse just red brick, because it didn't need um, any kind of day mark since it that would distinguish it from the others either that or maybe they ran out of paint uh, <laughs> so we discussed the the day mark of the tower but what about the night mark but uh, more commonly known as the light pattern what was the light pattern for the cape lookout lighthouse so the original structure uh, in 1812 it was a just a fixed light fixed white light uh, and it was like that way for over 100 years. Um, even as it transitioned to the new 1859 tower. Um, in 1914, uh, we get a light pattern of visible 20 seconds and 10 seconds not visible. And it was like that for a little over 15 years. And then it went to on for two seconds off for two seconds, on for two seconds, off for nine seconds. And eventually in uh, 1975, the pattern of, was uh, one rotation of light every 15 seconds. So it appeared that from a distance, it would appear that the light would come on and then 15 seconds um, would go by and then it would come on again. So it would flash every 15 seconds. And what was the... Uh, type of light or the fuel source or um, the bulbs that were, were in there. You know, we, we discussed the, the argon uh, lamps um, that were used uh, in, the early, in the early structure um, in the parabolic reflectors. But in the 1859 tower, um, we had the Fresnel lens was the reflector in the lens, still using the lamps. Um, started out with whale oil, actually, as the uh, fuel source. And then in 1873, it became a mineral oil or kerosene and whale oil, depending on what was available. Um, we see the changes in the lamps and the bulbs over the year. Um, 
So interesting to note is that 1933 we get uh, diesel generators that are that are starting to produce some electricity for the um, for the bulbs there. Uh, that in, starts out as a Fresnel lens in 1933 um, for the reflector or the lens, but eventually in 1975 two DCB 24 inch aero beacons are installed and those are basically like the big searchlights that you would see maybe at an airport or something and they remained in there until 2017. Um, the electricity source changed in 1983 to an underwater electric cable but we know today uh, in the recent, in recent past about three years or so the lighthouse now has been switched to solar panels and LED lights. So there's a lot of um, uh, concern about that and, and why that happened and how that happened. But basically that underwater electric cable was reaching its life expectancy and it was too expensive to run a new cable out to the lighthouse um, underwater. So they decided to go with uh, solar panels to light LEDs and um, the arrow beacons were removed from the tower at that time as well. So what about that first order Fresnel lens? Uh, it was taken out in 1975. Uh, the arrow beacons were put in. So removed in 1975, it leaves Cape Lookout. It goes to Portsmouth, Virginia uh, in, until 1994. Then it heads up to the Block Island lighthouse in Rhode Island. I guess they needed a lens for their lighthouse um, and that's where it is today. Uh, maybe it will come back someday. I, I really hope that it does because um, not necessarily to put back in the lighthouse and operate uh, the, the light with that using that lens but maybe to um, put in a museum. Maybe a North Carolina Maritime Museum or at least if anything uh, in the uh, Cape Lookout National Seashore uh, Visitor Center on Harker's Island, uh, and it would be a great way for people to look at and examine that Fresnel lens that was used in the Cape Lookout Lighthouse for so many years. So the light just didn't come on all by itself. Um, this is a list of head keepers of the Cape Lookout Lighthouse starting in 1812. Um, now keep in mind this is just head keepers. Uh, they had assistant keepers as well, and sometimes a second assistant, and they all lived uh, right there by the lighthouse usually. But when you look at these names, and if you're from uh, the area, if you're from Carteret County, uh, especially from around Beaufort and Harker's Island and, and uh, Atlantic or um, Sea Level and Marshallburg, you'll probably notice these are a lot of local names. These were people that were that were uh, holding these positions, head keeper, assistant keeper, were all hired uh, locally for the most part. Fulford, Royal, Chadwick, Mason, Davis, Gillikin, Clifton, Harris. So all these people were from the surrounding community. And on this map that was prepared by Connie Mason, um, it shows you for the second half of the 19th century some of those communities that those people may have come from. Uh, I, I circled a few of them there on the map in red. So Beaufort, Harker's Island, um, and then Lookout Woods. Um, and keep in mind that uh, it says on the map there, Diamond City, Lookout Woods, but it really wasn't until uh, sometime after the lighthouse was painted that people really started referring to the village at Lookout Woods as Diamond City. So that would have been after 1873. And um, one rumor is that there was a um, head uh, surfman at the U.S. Life Saving Station at Cape Lookout by the name of Joe Etheridge. Now, Etheridge is a more common uh, name from Dare County, and it's very possible that Joe uh, was serving in the Life Saving Service and then got his. Uh, head keeper position at Cape Lookout Life Saving Station and moved uh, to the area from, from Dare County. And he noticed the lighthouse looked like it had diamonds on it. 
and that this large community or village was near the lighthouse and he kept referring to it as uh, Diamond City um, and the name stuck from that point. So, so what did the lighthouse keepers have to do? So the head keeper and the assistant keeper, they obviously had to keep the light operating. Um, early on, uh, this was basically done uh, from the evening uh, all the way through until the, until the following morning. Um, and during bad weather uh, with low visibility, 24 hours a day. So they had to keep the lamps filled with oil and the wicks trimmed, uh, carry those five to 10 gallons of oil up 200 stairs to the top of the lighthouse, wind up the mechanism that rotated the lamp, um, at least until 1950, it was automated after that, uh, clean and polish the lens and the outside windows. And then basically they were living a sustenance type lifestyle for the most part. So they had a garden, they probably had some livestock, um, you know, anything you would associate with kind of a frontier life, um, they would have been doing something similar out there at the lighthouse. So in this picture, uh, you can see the lighthouse, but it's way in the distance. Uh, I just wanted to make note of some things that came along um, after the lighthouse was built. This is one of those. This is the U.S. life-saving station at Cape Lookout. It was a response to shipwreck. So the men that you see pictured um, to the uh, left side of the image here, right in front of the station, those were the surf men. They would use that boat that you see in the picture to row out and save shipwreck victims. Um, so the lighthouse would try to warn you about the dangerous shoals at Cape Lookout. Um, but if you still wrecked, uh, the lighthouse keeper, he couldn't go out and save you, but these guys could that, that worked at the life-saving station, and that was built in 1887. Um, so this is maybe what the what the grounds looked like in 1893. Uh, this uh, image was from the National Park Service. It was dated May 17th, 1893. We see the 1859 tower. The 1812 tower is gone at this point, but the original quarters Keeper's Quarters is there, off to the right. Now behind the 1859 tower, you can barely make out the 1873 Keeper's Quarters that was built. Um, in 1905, uh, the Lighthouse Board uh, puts out a series of light ships, which were stationed at dangerous locations all along the coast and these basically were to kind of back up or, or support and help the lighthouse operations um, they would have on, in north carolina they had three of these offshore one at diamond shoals one at cape lookout shoals and one at frying pan shoals um, down south uh, towards cape fear um, so the idea was that this boat was anchored uh, out beyond the distance that the lighthouse was effective and it had lights on it. It had a signal uh, bell um, and devices to warn ships um, that they were getting too close to the shoals. So if you can imagine being stationed on this, you were out there 24 seven um, in all kinds of weather, any kind of storm. The ships often broke anchor and were uh, washed up and run aground themselves. They uh, uh, were battered and uh, torn by the waves, they some of them even fell victim to um, being struck by other ships in poor visibility. Uh, one of them off of Hatteras was sank by a U-boat in World War I. Um, but nonetheless, they, it was an effort to warn mariners about those, those dangerous shoals. Eventually at Cape Lookout, they replaced it with just a light buoy uh, instead of the, the light. So here's a picture in 1913. We see uh, a second um, quarters standing to the left. So we see the 1873 quarters, and then we see the uh, a, uh, additional keepers quarters uh, to the left of that. Um, there's the 1873, and there's that one on the left built in 1907. In 1917, uh, at the location where the, the life-saving station was, um, 
and we've now the life-saving service has merged with the revenue cutter service to make the u.s coast guard uh, they get a new station so this is a picture of that new um, 1917 u.s coast guard station to the south of the lighthouse so the small building off to the left was actually a, the kitchen quarters they kept the uh, kitchen separate of the main building um, not only because if it caught fire you wouldn't want to lose the whole structure uh, but because cooking in the kitchen in the summertime uh, was uh, unbearably hot and you wouldn't want to uh, make it so so uh, difficult to um, keep cool there in the main house well another thing that happened to um, that the, the lighthouse has witnessed uh, over time was the formation of what we know as Barden's Inlet. This is an aerial photo of the Cape Lookout area from 1940. And Barden's Inlet had just recently formed about seven years prior from uh, a 1933 hurricane. Uh, so it helped cut through uh, where Shackelford Banks used to connect to uh, core banks there. South Core Banks, it, um, hurricane in 1933 helped cut through there um, and connect uh, the sound out to the uh, Atlantic Ocean. Uh, here's just another image um, of the lighthouse. This was about 1950. So the 1873 quarters is still there. Um, there's that 1907 structure. But that was actually relocated in 1958. It was actually decommissioned um, by the government and sold, uh, purchased by someone. They rolled it out uh, to the water and put it on a barge, and they floated it south uh, more into the hook of the Cape Lookout. And it's, it's still there today. It, it actually became someone's uh, summer cottage um, back for the Park Service. Uh, existed. So um, I think it's referred to as the Barden House um, for the uh, person that bought the structure. Um, so there, there had been ad advancements in navigational aids, and it's not that the lighthouse was rendered useless, it's just that there were other options for navigating along the coastline. Uh, but if you are a mariner and you spend time on the water you still use that lighthouse to help mark your location uh, whether you see the day mark or whether you see the, the light uh, at night time so all these other uh, innovations um, were just kind of added uh, uh, you know, benefits you know, to help you um, navigate but you still would look for that lighthouse if you're out on the water out there um, now the as I mentioned, the National Park Service does uh, manage the structures now. Um, uh, they have a little boardwalk network out there that when you get to the island, uh, you can go visit the keeper's quarters. Uh, it's a small museum set up in there. You can walk out to the beach and do some surf fishing and sunbathing. Um, and uh, at certain times of year, they uh, open the lighthouse up to climbing. So um, it's a lot of steps. Um, and if you're afraid of heights, I don't really recommend it, but it provides a spectacular view of the, not only the, the ocean, but um, out the inlet uh, as well and, and across Shackleford Banks. Um, uh, unfortunately, with the current uh, situation that we're in right now, um, the, the park is open, but the lighthouse is not open to climbing. Um, and the water uh, taxi, the ferry service, is not up and running either. Um, but hopefully in time that will all change and we'll kind of get back to getting out there and enjoying the uh, Cape Lookout Lighthouse and the National Seashore because um, it is a uh, very unique and stupendous uh, piece of piece of land um, so thank you for checking out our virtual programming i hope you enjoyed it and i hope that everyone out there is doing well